Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, close enough? Okay. Um, thank you very much to the organizers uh, and the sponsors for having me along. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, uh, past, present, and future. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, th thank you all for coming. What I'd like to talk about is uh, the future of Kaggle, a bit of a retrospective of where we've come from and where we're heading to. Just so I know uh, who I'm talking to, would you mind raising your hands if you've heard of Kaggle before tonight? Okay, keep your hand up if you have a Kaggle account. Uh, and keep it up if you've entered a Kaggle competition. Cool, all right. So nice uh, hometown crowd, that's, that's really great. Um, for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with Kaggle, uh, really great data science happens because of the intersection of people, data, and code. And Kaggle is kind of in a lucky position of, of sitting at the intersection of all of those three. Um, we got started right here in Sydney a few years ago, and we started with running uh, supervised learning, uh, sorry, uh, supervised learning competitions, machine learning competitions. Um, that's still our bread and butter, and we have some great ones running at the moment, so um, please do check those out uh, if you haven't been to our competitions page for a while. Um, that started off pretty small, uh, but now we're basically doing it at scale. So over the years, we've run hundreds and hundreds of these public-facing competitions, as well as a thousand or two uh, competitions for, for classes in a university. Um, in doing so, our community has built up. Now almost a million people um, are, are involved in Kaggle. Uh, people from all over the world, from all kinds of backgrounds have come together. Um, in the process, people have been teaching each other data science by working on competitions, by communicating on Kaggle and, and taking part in this stuff. Um, many, many thousands of people have, been, uh, have found this a really effective uh, learning me mechanism. We've also, in certain areas, helped to push forward the state of the art. So some of our medical diagnostics competitions uh, have been right out of the cutting edge. Uh, and we've also, um, we were also the first place to see a significant application of deep learning uh, outside image recognition uh, on um, neural activity data. <laughs> Along the way, we've learnt a lot. We've seen a lot of different aspects of data science. We've seen what goes well, what tends to win competitions, uh, how good data scientists work, and what can go wrong with data science, uh, and maybe how, how that can be fixed. Um, one thing that we've learnt is that really successful uh, machine learning practitioners um, don't just focus on fitting models, but they see it as an entire pipeline from the very abstract you know, business problem at the start all the way through to a solution in production, and they focus on every step uh, of that pipeline. Um, additionally, uh, a really common question that we get from, from people who are new to this stuff is, uh, to do well, do I need to like, invent my own algorithm or something? And, and Kaggle, uh, like the experience of Kaggle shows that that's emphatically not the case. Really successful Kaggle masters use off-the-shelf libraries, um, canned routines, uh, anything um, so that they can spend more time thinking about the data. Um, so things like uh, Keras for deep learning, XGBoost for, for general supervised learning, they just pop up again and again uh, in successful competition winners. <coughs> The most common problem that participants face uh, is overfitting. That's something that people have to learn to deal with and really wrestle with. Um, it's a very, very common temptation, and learning how to deal with that properly it, it will, is what mainly gets you from the bottom half of a Kaggle leaderboard up into the top. Beyond that, the thing that t um, really puts you over the top and into the top 10 of a major competition uh, tends to be ensembling. Um, that that um, being really good at ensembling uh, lets you scrape out those last few percentage uh, points that, um, that you know, make the difference between coming 20th and coming first. Um, so in a, in a typical competition that's not image recognition, or even then, we tend to see winners using you know, on ensembles, of, um, ensembles of ensembles. We've also seen things go wrong, things go badly, and in various ways we've seen just about everything that can go wrong with, uh, with data science in competitions and in general. Um, one of the most common problems certainly that we deal with is leakage, where a particular feature um, means that the model learns something it's not supposed to or not allowed to. Um, so 
this is a, a recurring problem. It's, it's very, very difficult to deal with in general. And like one bad feature can ruin your entire week. But beyond that, um, it's remarkable how just the day-to-day -day work of data scientists um, is, is sort of working against them. So the typical practice of a typical data scientist in a lot of ways is like the old days when software engineers used to work in assembly. Everybody has to do really, really low level code all the time just to get started. Um, compared to software engineering today, with the breadth and depth and sophistication of the tools that you use in a modern software engineering shop, m typical machine learning tools um, look a bit primitive. Um, on top of that, there are many, many barriers to getting the data you need. Uh, regulatory barriers, procedural barriers, it's hard to find, it's hard to download. Once you've got it, um, it's very difficult to get data into a shape where it's actually you know, useful and, and relevant uh, and helpful to the question that you're interested in. Um, once you've done that, uh, you then have to do data cleaning. Now, um, the data that is in Kaggle competitions uh, is always pre-cleaned to a degree, but we've seen some really weird stuff over the years. So um, data on flight paths that have planes uh, taking off before they've land, uh, taking off after they've landed, um, caterpillar, uh, sorry, um, uh, bulldozers that were manufactured in the year 999, um, and some NLP prog uh, an NLP problem with um, automated essay grading where at, at many points the human transcriber just got sick of typing out the essays and would type out comments instead. This essay got good marks, but it's basically gibberish, so train your NLP no uh, model on that. Um, Another pain point people run into all the time is the transition from a prototype to production. So you expect that going from a little prototype out to general release is going to be your model's time to shine. Uh, it, it's moment in the sun and instead it gets burnt to a crisp. Um, that's something that, that happens a lot. Um, a really, really common pain point is um, just reproducing someone else's work. So uh, if you've ever found a research paper that you'd like to kind of you know, run their code, uh, play around with it a bit, maybe tweak it, um, even if they provide the code, just getting the right libraries installed, getting the right Python version, getting the right environment set up can take ages, like literally days or, or weeks. Um, this happens in the enterprise with just people you know, trying to reproduce somebody's work from you know, just down the hallway or your own work from six months ago. It shouldn't really be like this. So for a start, accessing data should be simple and easy and, and kind of friendly. Um, you should never have to repeat work that other people have done. Um, you wouldn't believe how common it is to hear that data scientists in their day-to-day -day work spent a week getting up to speed with a new data set only to discover that somebody in the next department uh, had done exactly that work just three months ago, but they, they had no idea that this had already been done. We shouldn't have to do that. Um, <clears throat> when you want to... Uh, when you want to add some new data or change some code, you should be able to rebuild your entire pipeline from inputs to outputs um, with simple commands and not have to rely on you know, manual iteration or, or humans in the loop. Um, if you want to make a small tweak to something that's worked already, that should be a simple process. Um, and the descriptions and metadata, the stuff about the data that you're using, it shouldn't be in people's heads and it shouldn't be in some document management system somewhere. It should be right there with the data, like ready to use as a reminder when you need it. Um, on, and additionally, um, in software engineering, they talk about the pit of success. Like it should be easy and kind of, kind of it should be natural and easy to do the best possible practices. Um, and it shouldn't be kind of complicated and, and weird and, and, um, and difficult. So this is, these are the kind of pain points that we're currently working on changing. Um, in, the, in order to, to move towards that, we've added to Kaggle competitions two new products, uh, something that we call kernels and Kaggle data sets as well. Um, so I'm just going to hop out of the presentation at this point make an offering to the demo gods and try a live demo. Uh, I need to, sorry, I just tether to my phone again. Um, I th should have a page cached, great. Um, so while this Wi-Fi is just getting set up, um, Kaggle datasets 
is um, we launched it a year or so ago, and now it's a very wide array of um, data sets that basically people have uploaded, various organizations have provided. Um, it's all public, it's all searchable, and it's a place for people to uh, it's a place for people to explore data and just kind of see what's out there. So this is like a prototype of, of, of what we're building towards. Um, one feature that's, that's quite nice about this is um, if you click through into one of these data, data sets, um, you can see uh, the discussion, pe people comparing notes and, and comparing what they found on it, um, but also as well as like the official kind of descriptions and metadata of it, um, there's stuff like uh, column descriptions. So um, in a, a data set about craft beer, um, this is, you know, it might be a pretty typical experience in data science to load a CSV and find cryptic column headers, but, uh, you know, something like ABV, but um, you can just see that it's uh, I don't know how legible that is on the VGA, but um, ABV means alcoholic content by volume. So stuff that other people have gone to the trouble of finding out, you can easily kind of reuse their work. Um, I'll just see... Hmm. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. Oh, there we go. Great. Um, if you... you can launch a kernel um, on one of these data sets. So a kernel is what we, um, what we think of is as a reproducible code service. Um, so we have <laughs> batch scripts um, and also interactive notebooks. Um, if you go into either one of these, um, it's, the notebook interface is, is based on and powered by Jupyter Notebooks, if you're familiar with that, but we've added some extra tweaks to it. Um, for example, the ability to browse through the input files that you're using so that um, it's kind of easy to just remind yourself of, of what the column names are and that kind of thing. You don't have to fuss around too much. Um, but once, you're, once you click New Kernel or, or new, new Notebook, um, you're basically ready to go with a live uh, live environment. So pandas as pd. Um, we can just go like beer equals pd. Is it read csv? Yep. Read csv uh, input. I think it's called. There yeah, we go. Um, and then you're off and running. Um, we have a Python and R environment which comes pre-installed with uh, any data science library that you could think of using. So um, if it's something really tricky, uh, like OpenCV, um, which I know from experience can take days and days to install and get working, um, it's just ready to go. There's no fussing around. Um, so so that's, that's another feature that I really like about it. Um, an additionally nice thing about kernels is that uh, it lets you build on other people's code. So you're not starting with a blank sheet of paper anymore. And this is most obvious in Kaggle competitions. Um, if you jump into a random competition like, like Spurbank that's running at the moment and you want to get started, um, there's only a month to go, so you, know, you need to uh, start running quickly. Um, what you can do is just browse the kernels for that competition and see what other people have done and what kind of exploratory code they've done. Um, if you cl click through to one of these kernels that you like the look of, uh, you can then fork it. Um, as soon as you fork it, then that code is available for you to tweak and edit. Um, and you can pretty much run it uh, as soon as Jupyter boots up. You can <coughs> run it top to bottom. Um, you can start playing around uh, and maybe um, muck around with some of the parameters that somebody used and see what happens when you, when you make these kind of small changes. Um, by default, these things are public, uh, so you can then publish it, share your work, other people will build on it, upvote you, send you notes of thanks. It's really nice. Um, we were a little bit nervous when we introduced this uh, 18 months or so ago in, in, as our very first V1 prototype um, because um, there's, kind of, there's always kind of a tension in Kaggle competitions where there's a really nice uh, it's, it's kind of a nice balance between competitiveness and camaraderie and we were unsure about how much people would be willing to reveal about the code that they were using on a live competition. What we found is, is that uh, it's actually been wildly successful, more even than we were expecting in this prototype. Uh, 
uh, by a couple of orders of magnitude. So um, previously, people would share code in the forums of a competition. And typically, you would see maybe five or six pieces of code get sent around. And then there'd be a long discussion thread about how this doesn't work on my computer. And oh, you need that version of this library and stuff. And so you know, five or six pieces of code. Now, in a typical competition, there's maybe 500 uh, or more um, of these kernels, uh, of e each of them, you know, a, uh, a high quality piece of work that, that people have, oh, on some aspect of the competition, that people have made to share. So that's what I wanted to show you of, of Kaggle datasets and, uh, and Kaggle kernels. Um, I urge you to check them out if you haven't already. Um, uh, we've built this out basically as a prototype and we've, we've been working on improving it and, and, uh, and adding features to it. Um, recently we joined up with, uh, we've become part of Google Cloud Platform. Um, uh, which we see, Google sees as a great way to get access to our community to sort of, you know, help publicize the, the kind of products that they're, they're making at Google Cloud. But we see it as a fantastic opportunity to use their resources uh, and really scale this stuff out um, much faster than we would have been able to otherwise. Um, we feel like we've built maybe 1% of, of what this could be. Uh, and we're really excited to, to now go ahead as fast as possible um, and go from a place where serious data scientists do their side projects and their kind of weekend fun and build towards something that is actually useful for people to do day-to-day -day work with. In the future, we want um, data sets uh, the world over to be easily accessible with a common interface, easily searchable, um, where the data itself comes with the metadata, people's comments and discussion, and uh, executable code, all kind of wrapped up in a package. Um, so this, we think, could be useful uh, as an enterprise product, you know, a, a private version of it, um, just for, for data science teams to, to share their data, their code, um, to, and basically to make it much more efficient to build on each other's work. Um, as, as part of all this, we see uh, a kernel um, as like a single block of reproducible data science, where um, a kernel comes with version controlled code, version data, um, and the execution environment are all 100% reproducible. Um, as a result, kernels can be uh, like a, can be a, a key part of your continuous a, a continuous integration server for your data. So as new data comes in, it can be efficiently, automatically um, incorporated into your data science pipeline. Um, and, and humans can spend their time thinking about these kind of problems instead of having to deal with the nitty gritty, uh, low level details all the time. In the process of building out these products, we've also fed back into the competitions that we run. So we recently launched our first code only competition where in order to enter the competition uh, you had to like write kernels and th they were all private in that case and but they would execute um, in that kind of environment so we've done one and we it went really really well and we're excited to do a lot more in a lot more different directions um, competitions on Kaggle started out as like static uh, supervised machine learning problems you know a train set and a test set but using kernels we can sort of get back to where we started and build competitions out into, into these new directions. Um, time series, reinforcement learning, uh, data science with computational constraints, all these other exciting ideas is what we're looking forward to doing um, in the near future. So we think that Kaggle competitions, data sets and kernels have a really exciting future ahead. Um, I hope that you'll join us along that journey by taking part in, in Kaggle and, and playing with all of these things. Um, so thank you very much for your time and uh, I'd be happy to take questions. I think, uh, yes, please wait till I get to the mic. Are there any questions for Jamie? Jamie, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I think that Kaggle is a great environment for doing um, competitions. But what I find a bit unfortunate is that Kaggle can be seen also as a great source of knowledge, which is hardly utilized. In terms of what types of problems defeat what types of models, and vice versa. So does Kaggle actually do any work in that? Does Google, does Google actually see itself as a knowledge base of 
which models to apply when? Yes. Um, so, uh, in terms of Kaggle's uh, current position as a knowledge base and a potential, I think our current position shows. Um, I mean, you, you, in your question, you mentioned uh, I think what models can be defeated by certain problems, uh, and certainly, certainly people's experience in competitions shows. Um, which models do well and which models do badly on, on that particular problem. I mean, um, it's kind of like a, it's a very, it's it, it, one of the nice aspects of, the, of this field is that, um, is how kind of objective it is. So, um, you know, like any field, machine learning gets a bit of hype and a bit of excitement about new methods, but in a competition setting, like it either works or it doesn't. Uh, and that's, that's really, really valuable to see. My question is actually not about competition. As right. any data science, having a new problem, I would like to know which model should I choose. And it takes actually a great amount of time to find out and to experiment oh, uh, yeah. to see which model should I apply. Sure, sure, sure. So my question was about um, if I see a, a certain type of problem, yeah. I know what problem is there. Yeah, OK. And actually, is there a possibility to find out what are the best opportunities in terms of modeling I can apply to get at least to the top possible results? Right, right. Um, I think that uh, the Kaggle data sets are showing a lot of potential in that um, in that area. So what this is entirely self-serve, like it's kind of bring your own data. Um, and what we found uh, quite a few times now is is people just uploading a data set that they've been working on and saying, I think this data set is interesting. I'd be really interested in what other people can do with it. Um, there was one on uh, human resources analytics. A uh, human resources manager from U somewhere in Europe um, uploaded this anonymized data set on, on some aggregate features of, of different employees and whether they were successful or not or, or stayed with the company or not um, and just said, you know, see what you can do. And, th and that's had like dozens and dozens of kernels and a lot of discussion and um, it was just somebody who uploaded it because they, they thought it was kind of an interesting, interesting problem. So, um, yeah, I think, I think Kaggle data sets can really, uh, can really help with that. Um, in the future, uh, I think uh, research papers having reproducible kernels attached to them would also be a, a really interesting perspective on on kind of how particular models work and and what you can apply them to. So, thanks for your question. Question over here. Hi. <coughs> uh, how will Kaggle kernels handle neural nets with large memory requirements for training? And does it integrate with Google Cloud? Yeah. Um, Great question. Um, that's uh, something that we're working on. Um, so in the near future, we want to allow people to kind of scale up their their kernels a bit, um, and uh, and yeah, you know, use the entire Sydney data center or whatever if they want to. Um, so yes, currently we we can't support it because we're still in kind of version one. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely something we're we're looking to do as soon as we can. Another one over here. Hey. Hey. Follow-up question: uh, Are you planning to have a PySpark kernel? Uh, yeah, there. Um, uh, right now, we only support R and Python. It's it's kind of like really simple, but building out as many environments as we can is is on our roadmap too. Yeah, that would be a, so and have a concrete uh, timeline for this. I can't promise you a concrete timeline. Um, we're uh, busily recruiting resources and engineers within Google, um, so as soon as we can, uh, yeah. And over here. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Uh, my question is, there are a lot of competition and, and there are a lot of winners. What is the average performance of the winners? I'm sorry, the average performance what of? What is the performance of the average performance of the winners? Of the winners, um, generally in a typical competition, uh, what we find is that the performance of the top, the top tier people uh, models on the leaderboard um, is usually beyond what the host is capable of doing, and even was expecting would be possible. Um, most competitions push at the frontier of what you can do with a given data. Oh, am I misunderstanding your question? What is the performance percentage of the percentage? For example, if, I mean, there is a there is a model, and sure. the, the, the model yeah. with the data set, and then there is a percentage of the record. Right. And then what is the? Oh, okay. So. Is that <coughs> sure, sure. Um, I, mean, I mean, 
Uh, I think it, that is very close. It's why it goes all the time. There are huge different domains and uh, not yes. process and uh, models. Yeah. And I think actually Kaggle is a kind of reference library about yeah. data set and point model and what is good for what sort of data and what sort of problem. Yes, so yes. What is the performance of the whole list of every uh, uh, winners? Sure. Every performance of winners. Um, you have a lot of the list of data, so that's why sure, sure. Um, yeah. So, the, so the question is, what is the typical uh, what is the typical loss value, loss function value of of a winner of a competition? Um, and I guess it is kind of like a how long is a piece of string sort of question because it does it very much depends on the data and what's possible in the data. Um, so, <clears throat> some competitions. Uh, some competitions they just sort of get way down into the the you know fifth decimal place of, of an AUC or something to, to get the number one position. Other data sets um, like uh, right now we're running a competition with NOAA um, where you have to count the number of sea lions in an aerial photograph, uh, and that's a really really tough one. I mean it's like you have to be good at image recognition and then also like it's it's a real mind exploder. So like the 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 kind of Error scores that people are getting on the top of the leaderboard at the moment are like, you know, they're they're not in the fifth decimal place. So like, it's a really tough competition. So, so that's that's unfortunate. It, it kind of depends on on what's possible with the data. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. So I'm participating in several competitions. It's okay. one of the things that I enjoy the most in data science, and it's okay. quite interesting when you, after spending a few hours, you manage to improve your ranking by maybe 50 or 60 positions in a good day. But Sounds then you wake up the morning after and see that your ranking has gone down like 100 <laughs> positions because <laughs> right. you are in Australia, time difference, all that. Yeah, right. The feeling is that I see a lot of people that is maybe 24 hours on, on competition. Whenever you are there, right. they are already there and they have made progress. Right. Have you made a study of the hours that oh. people put into a competition and how that relates to their ranking? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a fascinating question. Um, I, there is actually, if you go to Kaggle datasets, there is a dataset called Meta Kaggle where you can explore in a lot of fine detail, like competition submissions, competition scores, and stuff. So, like, I would love for somebody to build a kernel to answer that exact question. Um, I can give you my hand wavy approximate answer based on an impression, which you know, um, which is that uh, typically people who get a podium finish make a lot of submissions, like. Um, particularly in a popular competition to get you know number one number two you have to spend a lot of time you know just just iterating every possible angle you possibly can um, but if that's systematically true I mean sometimes uh, there was one really recently where somebody just made like three submissions and then ended up in the top five like Jack from Japan. right 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 like, like, how do they do that um, <laughs> yeah so the Facebook one. right 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 yeah not bad. Um, yeah, in, in the very, very early days, people used to try to sneak into the bottom of the leaderboard by, um, if it was like a probability prediction, they would invert the probabilities, yeah. So they would know their score, but then at the last moment, jump up to the top and, you know, but they, they closed off that loophole pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I'm, in, I'm interested in kind of data sets. Um, oh, hey. What? Uh, what responsibility do you intend to take around data quality and, I, I guess, issues like legality? So, hmm. if someone de-identifies a data set and puts it up and then it turns out it's not so de-identified, or if someone puts up a data set and it turns out to be not a very good one, right. are, are you, like, this is almost like the Facebook versus traditional media discussion about how much responsibility do you take for that content? Yeah. Do you have a position yet, or is it something you're still going to... That's a really good question. Um, the... Uh, so, like, in terms of responsibility for legality and responsibility for the data specifically, I should say I'm not a lawyer. These are my personal opinions. I don't have a particular policy I can I can quote right now. Um, but at the, at the sort of broader question, though, is like taking responsibility for the quality of the data and just like what's up there. And I think the the system is the the way that we set it up um, for for public data sets is I think working pretty well, which is you can upvote data sets. Um, and by default, 
like you, you can search around every data set we've got, but by default, when you just go to the data sets page, they're ranked by what we call hotness. Um, and so things like people upvoting it, people writing kernels on it, people asking questions about it and chatting about it, all of that will cause, oh, and, and you know, updates to the data set, that kind of activity will cause things to bubble up to the top. And we do get a lot of junk. Well. We, we get a bit of junk uploaded where people are just testing the data uploader or something, you know, and that ends up on the public data sets page. But after two minutes, it just collapses down to the bottom because nobody is really interested in it or has any engagement with it. So um, on the broader question of taking responsibility for the, the quality, uh, I'm hoping that we won't have to go the Facebook route of hiring an army of, of human inter, you know, um, monitors to, uh, to, to kind of look at the quality and, and it will sort of take care of itself. So thanks for the question. Fascinating stuff, Jamie. Um, are there any more? One last question for Jamie. I don't see any more hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. Sure. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> with the recent announcement of Google AI and stuff like that, and you mm. guys just joined Google Cloud Platform, do you have yeah. any like anything on that or? Sure. Uh, no, it's definitely part of it. Um, so the general strategy uh, of of Google AI and Google's Cloud ML is to, um, uh, they're calling it democratizing machine learning. So basically taking these uh, advanced cutting edge techniques like deep learning, you know, TensorFlow, this and that, and making it available to as many people as fast as possible in, you know, as, as broad a possible scale. Um, so we're part of that. It's, it's why they were sort of excited about, about us, which is um, it's um, the Kaggle community is, is just um, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of really interested people to engage with and, and try these products out with and stuff. Um, just let me say par uh, parenthetically, um, we are staying a little bit arm's reach, uh, sorry, arms, uh, you know, a little bit distant from Google itself. So um, we're going to make sure to continue to support, you know, um, like Amazon, for example, is really heavily invested in XGBoost and, uh, and MXNet. Um, so like, 100% supported on Kaggle, where you know that's still in full effect. Um, so it's just that we're going to be able to leverage Google uh, and CloudML's resources to kind of make Kaggle a bit more exciting and fun. So thanks very much for your question. Please join me in thanking Jamie for the fantastic.